Great. So for the next 45 minutes before lunch, or lunch if you're in the Pacific Standard Time Zone, um, we are going to be going over one of the notebooks that was sent out for the flipped classroom um, aspect of this workshop. This is going to be an introduction to the QDF library. And for those who have had a chance to work on the homework, thank you for that. Um, we'll be reviewing it and also taking questions on that as well. For those who have not had a chance to, to get started, that's okay. Um, we are not going to be going into depth about all aspects of it. Um, so we, it, we encourage you to you know, take some time on your own to do this as well, but we will be covering uh, the entirety of both of these notebooks. So I'm gonna quickly share my screen again. And also if there are questions that um, you feel like asking, please do use the chat. Um, I think that that system worked really well um, in the last session as well. In the last session as well. Is this large enough font for people to see, or should I make the font larger? It's okay, but it could be a little larger. Okay, let me let me enlarge it. That's great. Great. Okay. Um, so again, um, hopefully some of you had a chance to work on this. If not, that's okay. This is going to be a fairly comprehensive, but you know, high level overview of the QDF library. It's geared for new users. Um, and if you're familiar with pandas, a lot of this should look very, very familiar. So we're gonna start by introducing pandas and then move on to QDF in case some folks are not as familiar with pandas. So again, these are just some basic imports. NumPy is the standard PyData ecosystem numerical Python library for array processing. We're setting a seed in order to make sure things are reproducible. And so then we get to pandas. Pandas is for structured and unstructured data, um, usually in the form of text, not really images and video. It's more about structured, um, structured data. And it's a data frame tool that lets you do things like this. So in this case, we're using pandas 0 0.25, which I think is the current release. Or it's, sorry, it's the, the release before the current one, but they're now at 1.0. And so it lets you do things like create a data frame, put some values in a column, and put some more values in a column. You know, this, this is sort of very basic Python syntax for creating floats in you know, a range of numbers. And you end up with this object, this is a data frame, that has two columns, each of these things. And you can do things to it, like summations, you can do aggregations, and you can do all sorts of different things. You, know, you could take the mean. And there's a, lot, there's a whole host of them, and there's lots of documentation. Now, QDF is the GPU equivalent of Pandas. You know, Pandas is great for small data sets that fit into your memory and workflows that aren't super intensive computationally. But the baseline Pandas rule of thumb is that for every gigabyte of data that you're going to be working with, or you know, every megabyte, you want to kind of have at least five to 10 times as much available memory in order to avoid going out of memory. And these are, you know, these are actually guidelines that Wes McKinney, who's the lead developer and, and creator of Pandas, has put together. And the reason for that is complicated, but it, it relies on the way Pandas' internal structure called the block manager handles things. But the result of that is, you know, Pandas is an incredibly powerful tool, but it can run into problems with efficient computation and problems with blowing up memory. So QDF is the GPU version of this, um, designed to solve a lot of those problems and to be faster and stay on the GPU. And you'll notice now that in, the next, in this code block right here that I'm about to run, this is going to look just like this code block. You know, we're doing the exact same code right here, but we did it with pandas. With QDF, we do it with QDF. It's the same code, except we use a QDF data frame, the CUDA data frame. And we're using QDF, actually, I'm actually, I apologize, I'm actually using a 
version ahead of the, the stable release, we release nightly versions as well. Every time we make a new change, there's a new version that you can get if you want to get the tip of the spear development version. And I apologize for not pinning mine to the 0 0.13, but all the features will work in that. But so the point is, it's, it looks the same. You know, this data frame, the only way you'd know this was on the GPU is by looking to see it's not a pandas data frame. It's a QDF data frame. And so we can do things to it. You know, as before, we can get the sum. The syntax is the same. This is important because it allows you to be productive. And sometimes it also allows you to just drop and replace some of your existing code and put it on the GPU. It reduces the cognitive burden and lets you focus on the actual workflows. And so now we're going to go through sort of the basics of QDF. And there are some exercises which we can go, which we will go over. Um, for those who have not yet had a chance to look at this, their solutions, excuse me, the solutions to the exercises are in the notebooks. So if, when you do this later, or if you do it later, try not to cheat and look at the solutions, but they are there if you need them. And so you can do things like create series. You know, a series is an individual column of data, just like pandas. You can do it with nulls. You can do it without nulls. QDF supports an extensive list of operations that fully support nulls. You can also create the data frames like before. You can create them, you know, you can think of a data frame as just being, this one is just three separate columns. You know, this is one column. There's three columns here. In this case, you know, just some integer columns. You can also create a data frame in a different way. Um, I see there may be some questions. Um, uh, Lori, if there's any questions that you think are worth stopping for, please just, um, just let me know. Um, um, otherwise, we, we can get to them. to be interrupted, or should we hold them to the end? It doesn't matter. I think i um, happy to, for, for you to use your judgment, whatever you think. All right, well, ask away, folks. Great. Um, so if you noticed here that these data, you know, these data frames are being created on the CPU, right? We're doing, this is a standard Python operation. We're creating this in the CPU. We can also create this directly on the GPU by using other tools. Um, and we'll, we'll show an example of that. But just keep that in mind. Now, you might already have a data frame. Maybe you have a pandas data frame on the CPU, and you want to make that your QDF data frame. You can do that too. QDF provides a from pandas API that lets you take a pandas data frame and put it on the GPU in the same way. Now, just like you would do with pandas, you can do things like call head. And note that I'm using print, but you know, there's no need to use print here. It just depends on different people's machines. Sometimes it's more consistent to use print. You can use head to get the first two rows or to get the first five rows. You can do a sort. This is the same API as pandas, for those of you who are aware. You can sort by one of these columns, in this case, by column B. I can also decide if I want to sort ascending. In this case, I didn't want to sort ascending. But by default, you will. That's consistent with pandas. Now, just like pandas as well, you can do things like select columns, you can select rows, you can select all sorts of things. And you can use this syntax. You know, for those of you familiar with Python, this is the get item syntax. So essentially, this is using the get item operator of this data structure. This is a canonical Python data structure, or excuse me, a Python method of a class. And it defines this protocol, which is essentially actually called the get item protocol. And it lets you grab things from this data structure. So this is column A. We can also grab column C. We can also select by label this dot loc dot loc. This is the same kind of API for pandas. In fact, it is actually the same API. And it lets us grab specific rows and specific columns by name, if we were so inclined. We can also grab by only position. We don't have to grab by name. You can get the first row. Uh, notice that, like pandas, the first row here is returned as its own column. That's consistent with pandas. You can also grab the first several rows of the first two columns. Again, this is by position rather than by name. And you can also use direct access. Um, it's, you know, it's generally better to use these I lock, the index location, and lock, but you can use direct access. And so as an exercise, you know, actually, I think I may have already put the solution in this one. I apologize. But 
you can try to select only rows at index four and nine. And so you can do this. You might want to pass four and nine like this, but you'll get an error because it's expecting this to be inside of a list that's similar to pandas. And that's going to give you those two rows. You can also do more complicated things like create filters on data sets by using Boolean indexing. And what that essentially does is lets you filter. So in this case, we're going to say, I'd like all of the rows in which the value for column B is greater than 15. And that's what we get. And as expected, if you were to take this out, this would create that Boolean index. You know, it's true for these, it's false for these, just like in, in Pandas world. There's also a query API. You know, you can use the query API instead of doing things like this. You can say, I want things where B equals three. Okay. You can also pass variables to this. You know, if you have a local variable defined, you can pass it in. And, you know, this is something that is generally pretty useful. Um, you can also do this with the local dict keyword. Um, you could pass this as a keyword argument to look with local dict. And you would just pass it there. You know, you could rename this something else. And so this lets you do all sorts of kinds of operations. Um, the standard Boolean operations are all supported. And so as an exercise, you know, I will go through this, trying to select the rows in the data frame where the value in B is greater than C plus six. So I want to select where DF plus BFB is greater than DFC plus six. And there we go. Once we get down to here, you know, this is six plus six is 12. Once we got to seven, it would no longer be true. And so we don't get that as a result. And you could see the solution if you're following along on your own notebooks. Missing data is also supported. We can do things like filling in missing values. We can do things like descriptive statistics. Um, if I create a series, in this case, just from zero to nine, we can do things like means, variance, standard deviation, kurtosis. You know, we can do skew. We, sorry, we could do skew. We could do all sorts of different things. You know, well, there's no skew here, but we could do all sorts of different things. And we can describe the data to get the, the summary statistics and get the, you know, the inner court, the quartiles. We can also apply functions. And in the next notebook, part of the homework, we will see more depth about how you can do this, but you can naively do a lot of things with just basics. You can add 10 to every value in a series. Now keep in mind that currently, as of today, QDF does not support applying custom functions on string columns. It only supports this today for columns that are not strings. So numeric or date time, um, but generally numeric columns. But it works and it's nice. Um, we have a full support of string methods, but we don't yet support user-defined functions for string methods. Um, but so for example, you know, I encourage you to check out the documentation. Um, I have our homepage documentation right here. This is the Rapids site, docs.rapids.ai. And there are links to this in the Jupyter notebook to see the QDF or the strings API guides themselves. But you, know, you can do things like lowercase your strings. You can do all sorts of different things, such as uppercase them. And as expected, it will follow the same API. So we can uppercase our strings, which look like this, with that .str accessor. This is something that those of you who are familiar with pandas should recognize. This is the string accessor, and it's how pandas exposes its string functionality. QDF is the same, it's the same API, and there you go, off to the races. Um, things like concatenation, you can combine columns, noting that you can, by default, have the indexes repeat. You can force them to be consistent. You can do all sorts of things with them. You can also concatenate them on a different, ax on a different axis if you're so inclined. This should look very familiar for those of you who have used pandas before. You can append, essentially just a large, you know, a single type of concatenation. You can do joins and merges. In this case, we're just creating some data. We're doing a left join, just like pandas, on the key, and we're getting the result. Note, though, 
that our order has changed. By default, parallel joins will not preserve order because that would add an explicit step to the operation, which may reduce, which would hurt performance. You can enforce this, but by default, the default join will not enforce order. So the exercise is to do an inner join. And so to do an inner join in this case, just like before, you would do dfa.merge with dfb. We're going to say, I want to do an inner join, not a left join. And we're going to join on this key. Now, if the keys were different, we could actually use a different syntax. Or we, sorry, we would have to use a different syntax. Note that the inner join does not return the, the other values that they didn't actually have a collision on. It only returns the ones that collided, the three rows. If the keys were different, we'd have to use the left on and the right on arguments. Now, in this case, the keys are the same, so it doesn't actually, oh, sorry, it doesn't actually matter. But if they were different, you know, if this was key five, key four, and this was key three, then we'd have to do it like this. So that's a join. Like pandas, we also support group buys and this sort of split apply combine paradigm. Um, for those of you who use R, you may be familiar with this. You know, um, Hadley Wickham has done a lot of really good research and, and infrastructure development around this kind of design oriented um, data flow. And it's a really fantastic paradigm and we support this fully. Um, you can do things like aggregations. You can do group buys, call some. You can do more complicated group buys where you want to do things differently to different columns. You could also do multiple things to this column by putting it in a list. And you know, I could do count here. As you can see, it's quite comprehensive. Oh, so I guess I um, sort of got ahead of myself, but you can do this multiple, multiple at once. Um, you can also group by multiple columns. So if I were to take this and run this, what I could do is put this in a list. And I could also group by the second aggreg aggregate column. And now I'm going to have a hierarchical group by. And again, this should look very familiar, but it's very useful. And it's also fully on the GPU. Now we also have time series work that we support, which is great. The time series work is using the GPU based um, you know, date, um, date time variable and date time data structure. And so, you know, this is a QDF data frame that we put a pandas date range into. You know, we could have created this on the GPU, but for, for showing it, you know, right, oh, sorry. We can look at the, the D types here. We've got a date time nanosecond precision column. And of course, we have a float column. Fully supports this. And so, you know, if we want to do things with this, we can use the query API or use dot loc or all sorts of different things. And you know, if we wanted to do this query, for example, you know, we want to query only the rows with a date time before this date. Well, how would we do this? If we used query, would we possibly run into a problem here? We could say, I want to use the date that is before 2018, 11, 23. But remember, we don't support types, certain types of operations on strings for custom things like this. The query API will fail here. What you could do is say, okay, well, I'll use loc, the, the loc API. And I'll say, I want date to be 2018, less than 2018, 11, 23. Ah, sorry, date df. And so here again, we reach the problem. We can't do a date time operation yet with a string. So what we do instead is use the timestamp operation. And so if we do pandas timestamp, we can see you know, this object is going to create a date time object. And so you know, if we took this string right here and said, now we have a timestamp. With this time filter, now we know how to handle this. And we're off to the races. And so this is an example of how we can naturally support interaction between date time variables and date time columns. 
all sorts of things like that. There's also, of course, like Pandas, more detailed things, like you can take the minute, you can get oh, second, hour, et cetera. I won't go on. There's a lot of them. I won't go through the whole thing. Um, and you can do all of them, which is great. Now, some of you probably use Kupai if you've used GPUs. Um, Kupai is the GPU array library with a NumPy consistent API. And so QDF and Kupai play together incredibly well. In fact, they play together without having to make copies. So you can go between worlds without having to take time copying data in between. And for any data frame or a column or series, you can call the dot values API, just like in pandas, to go to a Kupai array. In pandas, this would go to a NumPy array. In QDF, it goes to a Kupai array. Now you can also go to pandas. You can call two pandas and it will just Put your data frame on the CPU as a pandas data frame, being consistent with your data types, with your null handling, with your all sorts of things. And you can also go to NumPy if you wanted to. You can call as matrix. Um, you know, you can also do this by going to Kupai and keeping things on the GPU. But if you need a NumPy array, you can do that as well. And you can also send a series to be a NumPy array with two array. Now I mentioned before that you know there's GPU accelerated writing. Um, this is only one small example I and mean, there perhaps is a, yeah, there's one small example of using CSVs, but again, you can use parquet files, ORC, all sorts of things, JSON. This is going to send our data frame to a CSV. Um, you can see that you know, I called it foo. We've got foo. It's just that same table that we have. We can read that file and it's the same API as pandas. And so that's it. Um, that's sort of the intro to, to QDF. And you know, for the next 20 minutes, we'll go into the user defined function section. But before we do that, I want to show an example of you know, what the performance can really mean. Um, you know, so if we had some random values, you know, just in this case, 10 million, we could make a data frame both in the pandas world and the QDF world. To, to call sum on this for pandas you know, on one of the columns, it's not too time consuming. In this case, we're using time it to you know, get a good estimate pretty fast, 60 milliseconds. For the GPU, 300 microseconds. That's you know, quite a bit faster. And in this case, you know, perhaps it's not so significant because you, if you only had to call some once, you know, 60 milliseconds is probably okay. But think about a more realistic example. You know, often we're doing operations many times. And so in this case, we're gonna simulate some sensor data. You know, sensor data is relevant a lot of workflows, and it's actually particularly relevant because it's kind of the kind of data we're going to be doing later in one of the NERSC workflows. Um, but in this case, we're going to simulate some sensor data with pandas. We're going to imagine we have a time series going from one day's worth of data, 2019, August, or sorry, uh, July 5th through the 6th, with a value for every millisecond. And then we're going to extract the hour, extract the minutes, print the shape, and get the data's head. And so this took 20 seconds. You know, it took 20 seconds. It's a lot of data. It's 86 million rows. It's a lot of data, but it's only, imagine one sensor's worth of data from one day. It's potentially very small. And a group by on this, you know, if we wanted to say, I want the max value for every thing on an hour and minute basis, four seconds. Imagine doing this for all of your sensors. If you had a fleet of sensors, this would take forever. Well, with QDF, we can do this much faster. Um, in this case, we're actually going to run the same code except just put it in a QDF data frame. So we're doing the data generation on the CPU still, um, but we're going to just put it on the GPU and show you how it's far faster to do this on the GPU. All these processing, in this case, actually, we added seconds. I don't even know if we did that the first time, but we added seconds, and it still took only two seconds compared to 20 seconds. The group by 52 milliseconds versus you know, four or five seconds, that's 100 times faster. This is just one example of a group by. It's 100 times faster. Other group buys might be 50 times. Others might be 300 times faster. It's going to depend, of course. Um, and so you know, I encourage you to play around to get a sense of you know, how this works. But at a high level, that's sort of QDF. It is a fully featured GPU-based data frame library. Um, and Lori, perhaps maybe we should take some questions now before we move on to the next section.
Uh, sure. Okay. So um, this question is from Ralph, and he was asking about the details of Boolean indexing. And uh, I can't really read uh, the example he posted in chat, but he wants to know: Can you search a data frame uh, for uh, uh, via the header? Um, so to, perhaps by by the header, do you mean? Do you think you mean Ralph? If you want to um, clarify, perhaps in the text, and we can come back to this later. Um, by do you mean perhaps by the column type or things like that? Uh, um, like the column name, for example, if the column name is B, can you search? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, can, you can take a look at the chat, or maybe Ralph can unmute uh, and ask. Oh yeah, I can. I can unmute. So uh, I, I also do it like uh, DF, then open parentheses, and then B close parentheses is larger DF. Yeah, yeah, it's larger than DF uh, C plus six, for example and then use this result as an index inside the bracket operator. Yes, you can. Oh, oh sorry, you wanted, you wanted to... <coughs> yes, this well, the first plus is uh, larger and then uh, uh, go to the very beginning of the line like uh, DF open bracket and then close brackets. Use that instead of the query. Yeah, this, is, this would absolutely work. So anything that generates a Boolean mask will be able to be passed to this. Mm -hmm. This will work. Um, okay, you know, so both, both methods are equal. There's no drawback for using one over the other. So there's no real drawback in this, but in general, it's, it's better in the, and there's a reason in the pandas world, and it applies here as well. It's better to be explicit in using lock when you do Boolean indexing, because often what happens is we're going to do a series of Boolean indexing in operations. And then in the pandas world, you might see this warning, perhaps many of you have seen it, that says setting with copy. And it's not an error, it's a warning that tells you you're setting with a copy. And that's a result of Boolean indexing and to create a new view on a data set versus a copy and then doing operations. And it can cause unexpected results. So while this does work and it will of course behave correctly, it often is more robust to use this specific accessor. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, that was the only question. So uh, if anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we can continue. Great. So, you know, we saw briefly in that other section of the notebook, or one of the sections of the notebook, that, you know, we have a user-defined function we can make. We can do that apply map on a series and things. But if we want to do a more complicated function, it's a little bit harder. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the reasons um, why GPUs are fast here. We've heard a little bit at a high level from Ayush that you know, there's many threads, many cores doing lots of work independently and then coordinating. This notebook has a, you know, a pretty decent overview of you know, what's actually happening when you write a custom function. And like, what does that mean in the CUDA under the hood? And I'm not going to spend the time now, but I encourage you to read it. It's actually fairly, um, it's fairly short, but it's fairly informative, I think. Uh, I have a question here. So I read this one. And uh, so you're using Numba. Um, and I'm just wondering, why wouldn't you call the number directly? Uh, why would you want to call it via Rapids? Great question. Um, so you can do both. So in this notebook, we actually link out to our docs that have an example of using Numba directly for uh, the, maybe it's in the API docs. Well, it's somewhere. But we have some docs that show how you can use Numba directly as well. And the reason you'd want to potentially use Numba directly would be if you need to do things that don't naturally map to the data frame world, you would want to use Numba directly. Um, if you can map your functions and you want to have it just kind of work in the data frame world and put your things in a data frame by default, this is a nice convenient API. Um, but you can of course use Numba directly. Cool, thanks. Um, great. So essentially in this, in this function, to create a user-defined function, you do have to rely on Numba. And so for those who are not familiar, Numba is a just-in-time compiler for Python code to transform that into an intermediate representation that then will run much faster because it's, I believe it's LLVM compiled. And for the CPU, the GPU, it gets eventually compiled down to something called PTX code. And we use this under the hood for these apply rows APIs that lets you do things like write a function called, that we called kernel to choose some columns to operate on, 
to name the output column, and you can even pass values into it. And there's a lot of stuff you can do here. Um, I'm not going to go through all the exercises, but I will go through one and mention that now this actually has been wrapped up into a new library that we have in the Rapids world called KuSpatial for spatial data analytics. This haversign distance function is you know, fairly commonly used. This has been wrapped up into a nice API, as well as many other things like point and polygon, um, trajectory modeling, and all sorts of stuff. But so this, you know, this exercise is to calculate the haversign distance between two points for all, your, all the points. And it's a fairly complex algorithm, a um, lot of steps. And so to do this, you would just run this. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to define the columns we care about in this function, and then we're going to have our output column. And we took this example from a Stack Overflow post by someone named Michael Dunn. In order to do this, you have to enumerate and loop through your columns. And so we're looping through the four columns, and we're keeping track of our index. GPUs rely on CUDA threads, and these CUDA threads need to be operating in the right place and send the data to the right specific index in the output. And so this API handles it for us. So to Lori's question of why might you want to use Numba directly versus this, with Numba directly, you need to actually be a little more explicit in making sure that your threads are writing to the correct spot. And it's, it's not hard, but you need to be a little more explicit than just looping through. And that's one advantage of doing it like this. We've taken care of that for you. But you can see that you know, we're just doing some math. You know? This algorithm is just math, and we've imported the standard math functions from Python's built-in math library. We're doing some math. We are printing some stuff out just for visual sakes. We don't need to do this. And then we're putting our output, and each thread will write independently in parallel to this column. And we'll run it. And we can see that we have the output, and I mean, we know it's correct. We had print statements in our code. These did not print here because this print is actually going to be running on the terminal from which this was launched, which is not shown in the screen. But it would show us that for every single one of these iterations that are happening in parallel, a lot of things are happening. You know, in this case, the array size was four. That was automatically created for us by um, QDF's number based UDF compiler. We had one, one block. We had 64 threads per block. We had up to 64 blocks. And it gives, just gives us information about this. And so in this case, um, that we only have you know, two, we have two blocks shown, but, um, or I guess we have a few blocks shown. But you can find more information about what's going on here. And Apply Rose handles it all for us. And so the exercise is to modify this to pass in the radius of the Earth as a keyword argument. So we saw that right here, we passed the radius of the Earth, 6371. But if we were on Mars, this would be completely incorrect. And I don't know off the top of my head what the radius of, of Mars is. But we could do this in the same way by passing in a keyword argument. And so how do we do that? Well, we look up ahead to back to where we were. And we saw that we can pass keyword arguments into this function. And our kernel will just grab them. It'll know. And so we can pass them into the kernel function, just like here, that quarg1, quarg2. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take this same process, and I'm going to say radius. And I'm not going to use this. I'm going to comment this out. I'm going to say that r equals radius. So we've got this. And now I have to execute it. Like before, I'm going to execute it in the same way. So I'm just going to copy this to save time. And you know, right now, you saw before that I was passing an empty dictionary. I had no keyword arguments. But now when I pass this, there's an error. Why is there an error? We're expecting a keyword argument. So I got to fill it in. So I'm going to fill this in with radius. And maybe I'll call it maybe I'll say five thousand. Yeah. Why not? 
we can pass it in and, oh no, we got a typing error. Why did we get a typing error? Oh, sorry, a lot of scrolling. A lot of times we're gonna see typing errors when we use Numba. In this case, we have an issue with the wrong type of argument being passed. And so, right here, it's expecting this to be slightly different. And so perhaps it's a little bit, it's just a little bit finicky, um, or perhaps I made a subtle, I made a subtle uh, typing error earlier. Um, but in general, um, we can do it like this, and you know, for now I will just grab the little, uh, the little solution. Perhaps I actually have to type it, pass it in explicitly, unless I do it differently. And well, maybe not. Um, well, for now I'll just take the solution, but there's a very subtle error that I'm likely making somewhere, and apologize for that. That's error. okay. Uh, but, your experience is common uh, with my experience in Numba, which is most of the time figuring out type errors. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, but we do have a question from Alex. Um, so maybe you can answer. So he says, uh, when the Haversine distance kernel is invoked, the grid and the block dimensions are not specified. Can we invoke the kernel and explicitly define the number of threads in a block and the number of blocks in the grid? Great question. Um, Yes, we can. So that would be a great reason to use Numba if you wanted to. But apply rows does all that for you. Um, it's, it's try, it automatically is going to try to optimize that under the hood. We do expose it with apply chunks. Apply chunks is going to let you handle specific things. You can do things like what are the threads per block? Um, what are the block counts? Um, I, don't know, I, I hope you can see this still, but I know it's a little hard with all the, all the prints, but you can do things like controlling the threads and the blocks and all that kind of stuff. It's the same API, but it's, it's with applied chunks. And we have a section about this right here. In fact, in the notebook, it goes through asking you how to set that. And you can see that when we do this down below, um, in the interest of time, I'll just skip to this. There is another exercise that is essentially the same as the one above. Um, but in, the, in this case, we can do the same function with apply chunks, and we can set this to be 16 chunks, eight threads per block, and it will of course run, but it will have run with these chunks and these threads per blocks. And we could also do the block count. Uh, does that answer the question, hopefully, Alex? Well, I'll assume it does. Um, so there's about five minutes left in this segment. The um, Next phase is apply grouped. This is a way you can apply the same kinds of user defined functions on a group by basis. Now this is a little bit more advanced. Um, so perhaps it's not necessary for a lot of people, but conceptually I just wanna show that you can do it. Um, and I encourage you to take the time to go through it. You can do things like take the rolling average of a group. You know, we can write our function and, and this, you know, might look a little bit more like a number function, for example. You can see that I'm explicitly going through the thread index, the total size of the, of the group, and you know, the block dimensions. And you can do this to, do, to basically just do a group by based user defined function. Now, in this case, it was a rolling function, and it was because I was gonna take the window size of three that we got these missing values. That makes sense. If a window size is three, by default, we're gonna have only results for when there's at least three values. And so I encourage you to spend more time after this or to really go through these notebooks to really see what's going on here. Um, the group by functionality is a little bit more complicated, as you can see, but it's incredibly powerful as well. Uh, okay, we have a question about the rolling average kernel uh, that you just showed. Um, Alex says, you have a branching condition uh, which could lead to warp divergence. Does the code take care of warp divergence automatically? Uh, the answer is that it depends, um, and it's complicated. Um, but it's by default, it, it probably will not take care of warp divergence. Um, it depends how it's going to get optimized. 
Is there any way that you as a user would know whether it does or not? Um, likely, yes. Um, not without adding some configuration. Um, and so I'd be happy to chat about that after this, but by default, you wouldn't get a warning about that if that's what you're asking. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, just as a note, it's not part of this, but this, this data frame, we did a rolling window calculation here to show that we could do it. You know, we, we could just do a rolling window. We support rolling. And so data frames in, on the GPU support rolling. So if we wanted to do this, you know, in this case, it's not a group by, but we could do rolling and do a window of three and take the mean. And in this case, you'd see 48, 51, 44. Now note that this is not a group by. With a group by, you have to use a group by API for now. But we do support a fully featured, or at least deeply featured, uh, rolling window API to do things. And you can also apply user-defined functions to rolling windows. And if you're really interested in user-defined functions, I, I highly encourage you to take a look at this guide to UDFs that we've put together. There's a lot of different stuff involved in user-defined functions and a lot of different opportunities for significant speedups with complex, with complex code. And there's an example of using a user-defined function and applying it onto a rolling window, um, which I encourage you all to look into. So hopefully this has been a useful 45 minutes for those of you who have not yet had a chance to work on the notebooks to get a sense of what they contain, um, you know, give you a, a sneak peek of you know, what you're gonna see when you go through the homeworks. For those of you who have gone through them, hopefully this has been useful to get some more context and um, see it as well. And with that, if, I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, uh, nope. Uh, so you can go ahead and uh, move on to QML. Uh, we're right on schedule. Great.